Hello, I'm Rock, and welcome to another episode of First Two Steps. We are kicking off the morning in a very, very special way with another special guest. So let's jump right in. In high school, they called him Flash, but you may know him as an elite cover corner in the NFL. That's right, I can only be talking about Nolan Carroll. Super excited to be here, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Yeah, sure. no problem. So you are a Florida native and definitely a destined athlete. Um, his journey began in Maryland. He touched down at the Miami Dolphins, then the Eagles, and my personal fave, the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for having us in your home. We really appreciate it, you being our first two steps. We're so excited to have you and share your story. Well, thank you. I mean, thanks for taking the time this morning and coming out here and speaking to you. So I definitely appreciate it. Oh, thank you. So we want to jump right in. When I think about football, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is discipline. Mm -hmm. And then I go to your, your parents being in the military and not just in the military, but top ranks of the military. Mm -hmm. I also think of discipline, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what kind of role that played in your life and in football, if any? It played a, a big role in my life. It, just, discipline is something that as an athlete you need because there's things from training to stuff on the field, communicating with your teammates, building those relationships, knowing your plays, not succumbing to a trick play or, you know, using your eyes and having them in the right place. That's all discipline. And, you know, for me, my parents being who they were and who they are still, right. discipline was the number one factor in everything. And I think that gave me a larger career than most guys because I was able to know what I needed to do and how I needed to do it. As far as showing up on time to right. meetings, not being late, doing what I'm supposed to do with my job, making sure I'm reading my keys when I'm out there on the field, making sure I'm using my fundamentals because there's a saying, and it's funny, I've heard my parents say it before, but it didn't resonate with me until my special teams coach said it when I was in Philly. And he asked us when times get hard, what is it that you do? Do you rise to the level of occasion? Do you rise to the level of the occasion or do you sink to your level of training? And I thought about that. I was like, man, as things start to get hot and wild, as things start to become bigger, you know, the games get more important, what is it that you're focusing on? Are you focusing on the game or are you going to focus on your fundamentals, the things that you need to do in your job to help you win the game? So when he broke it down that way, I, I said, that makes sense because a lot of people in the military, when you, you can't account for so many things that's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to get into an ambush. You don't know if you're going to get attacked. You don't know what your mission might be. You don't know the terrain. There's so many different things that you do not know, but what you do know is your training. So you always fall back on that to help you get through whatever obstacles it might be. So for them, when they, they taught me that value, it stuck with me for so long, and I used it every single day when I was in the NFL, and I still use it now. Wow, incredible, especially during this time where you must have discipline. If not, you're going to sink to the bottom. Definitely. So is this something, I'm already de deviating from script, guys, where I got a question too, but... Is this something that you instill in your son? Because I think it's, uh, I read a lot about the fact that you really try to be there for your son, be a different kind of father, very much involved. So is this something that you also instill in him? You have to, I mean, it starts when they're young. If they know when they're young, they'll be able to carry it on until they get older. But for my son, I just want him to know that, well, first, I don't want to take the route my parents were. My parents were strict, but they were, they were cool at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, for my son, I want him to know that his dad's always cool. I always want to play that cool you part, really cool but I just want him to be himself. I don't want him to feel like, oh, I always got to be riled up. I always got to be amped up because I don't want to get in trouble. And that's how it felt when I was growing up. And it wasn't a bad thing. It actually, it helped me out, but I want my son to know he doesn't have to look like that. He can be more carefree, but at the same time, he has to be responsible. At the same time, he has to be disciplined. So that means getting your work done before we play anything. You know, make sure you eat your vegetables before you can, oh, eat your, you, know, you can eat your desserts. And he understands that. He's six, but he's a smart six-year-old. I, I think he's he's more intelligent than I give him credit for because he's always thinking and he, he's always observing. So I know from the, the six years he's been on this earth, I've had to set the right example as far as being disciplined and, and being able to, you know, take care of him. He's got to see the way I'm doing it. He's got to see the way his dad interacts with his family, with his mother, with other people out in the public. And, you know, all those things come together to create discipline. And, and I think that if I continue to do it, he'll get it. He'll, he'll begin to feel it and understand it. You know, but there's no blue book there. There's no blueprint for raising a kid. As, no. you know, as a lot of people know, it's 
every day is different. And, but as long as you can be consistent, that's what is, is more important than anything else. Wow, amazing. So let's talk about, let's take it back to, to the football time. So, I mean, you excelled with Miami, you went to the Eagles, had an amazing pick six, which I did see. Although, I mean, I am a Cowboy fan, so you know how I feel about the Eagles. Yeah, yeah. But um, taking it to the Cowboys, there was a little bit of a rough patch. Mm -hmm. And I want you to tell us what was going on in your mind during that time and what kind of advice can you give to maybe somebody that's in the NFL possibly going through something like that. Well, what, what can you get? What can you tell us about that? Well, for me, my, it was weird. My experience there was completely different from going to Philly, which was mm -hmm. a sports town team. Like everybody lived and died with the Eagles to going to basically a circus of just Jerry's world. That's what it was. It was a show. Every mm -hmm. single day, the media was around. Right. Every single day, there was always something about the Cowboys. It didn't matter if it was Good news, bad news, not that important, important. It was always something every single day. And, and I think when I got there, a lot of guys were, they just wanted a division beforehand. So the guys were feeling themselves. Guys knew that, oh, we got this on lock, kind of. And I don't say they took it for granted, but there were so many other distractions at the time. We had the Zeke suspension. We had- Yeah, there was a lot the, going the, the on. There was a lot stuff. going on. You know, it, was, it was just a combination of a lot of things. And we had injuries too, but you know, for me, being there, it helped me. And at the same time, it was one of those things where people was like, well, that was the end of your career. But I never saw it like that because I was able to see the business aspect of football. I was able to see the business aspect of really life. And that was through Jerry and what he was able to do with everything. And you know, when I look back at it now, this guy's a, he's a genius. I genius. think he's, he's far ahead of his time. And mm -hmm. if you really look at what he's done, he had the stadium in Arlington, which is 45 minutes away from everything else. Mm -hmm. But he built this city, Plano and Frisco, Texas, is just north, that nobody's ever been there. If you think 10 years ago, there was nothing out there. And all of a sudden, you have Toyota factory. Oh, everything. You got, you got the Star. China facility. You got yeah, the Omni yeah. Club Hotel. You got mm -hmm. the medical facility. You got restaurants. You got the, the FC Dallas that's over there. That's so right. he had a vision that other people didn't, and a lot of people doubted him. Same when he bought the team back in, I think, 60 or 70 or something like that. And everybody said, you're crazy for getting a franchise that hasn't won a championship and see how he's turning around now. So being there, being exposed to that, being exposed to him and seeing how he is as an owner, I never got that. My first, I guess the first two teams I was at, they were good owners, but they weren't. Visionaries. Well, they were visionaries, but they just weren't in tune to what the team was mm -hmm. doing. Jerry was, he would fly his helicopter into practice. And he'd land it, talk to guys, see how they're doing. You knew every guy by his name. And I remember when I got my concussion, um, and I was in the locker room, he came in there and he wanted to know how I was doing, checking up on me, making sure I was fine. Cause I got two concussions that game. So it was serious. And for him to come down and check on me like that, that let me know this guy is more than just an owner. He's more than just somebody that is worried about the money. And, and when I saw that, I took a lot of information. I took a lot of lessons from my time in Dallas, even though it was cut short. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, Jerry Jones is definitely, and I've been to that stadium. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been to the practice facility. Oh, yeah. The practice facility costs more than the stadium. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's like incredible. Billion and billion. it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's immaculate. But what people also don't know is he works with the city. He built that stadium so other high schools, so other people could Can use that. There. So yeah, that was another, exactly. That's another bonus to what he was doing. That's another thing that triggered me to really pay attention to who this guy is. And, He's a, he's a good man. I think he doesn't get enough credit for what he's done in the NFL. Wow, that's amazing. So let's talk about your life after football, because I know you have also that business mindset, but before that, something that you're very passionate about is really helping people, helping these guys after the NFL. Mm -hmm. And most people would think, why? Like, why should we care about these guys after the NFL? They make millions of dollars, they can figure out something to do, but that's something that you really focus on, mm -hmm. right? You, you really want to help these guys. Why? And what, what are you doing to help them? More just about educating and using my experiences because a lot of guys just don't know. For the longest time, from six to maybe 28, 29, 30 years old, you've just been playing football. Like that's all you know. That's what your life is. That's what it revolves around. Your family revolves around that. When you go to school, school revolves around football. So your whole life is dedicated to only that and everything that I guess is outside of that doesn't really matter. So you have somebody else that takes care of it. So when you're done playing, 
all these problems kind of sink back into your bucket. And you're like, man, what is this? What's going on? I didn't know I had this bill. I didn't know I had that bill. I didn't know I gave this person money. I didn't know, you know, there's so many different factors out there that you're not paying attention to. And, you know, when I got done playing, I saw a lot of my teammates coming through that. I was like, man, you guys got serious problems. Somebody needs to help you out with that. And a lot of times what I was seeing was nobody was reaching out. You know, everybody thought that once they got done playing, once they got done putting on the helmet, it's like their superpowers on the way. And nobody really wants to help you. And that's a lonely feeling for a lot of guys. And they don't know how to combat that to try and be productive. All they know is their identity beforehand. And all I want to do is just help them. You know, I've met so many different people. I've traveled all over the world. So I've seen a lot. I've met a lot of people. And those people connected me to other people. And those people to others. And I was just beginning to learn. I began to piece things together. I began to see things differently. And I know that those experiences that I had, I can give to other guys. And the businesses that I build, I at least want to include guys into it, not just the business, but more of how to set it up. Because right. I was doing a lot of this on my own when I first started out. And I knew I had to do it that way because I had to learn. I couldn't just, okay. oh, here's some money, mm -hmm. go and invest and try and make me money. That's what a lot of guys do. But the person you're giving your money to, most of the time, they don't, they don't have the money on their own to make. You know, there, there's guys that's asking you for a bunch of money, $100,000, $200,000, whatever it might be, up to a million dollars. There's some guys that they've come to me and asked me for some crazy amounts of money, but they don't know how to manage it themselves. And they've never made it before. They've never even made $10. So how is somebody going to come to me with a great idea, just asking for money? It doesn't work like that. I need a business plan. I need structure. I need the, I need projections. I need to see who you're hiring, what you're going to do with that money if I give it to you. All these things need to be tied in so I can make the best decision possible to at least give you more money. You know? You know, obviously it's best to just say no and then figure it out later. Don't be inclined to give somebody your hard earned money. That's what a lot of guys do because they're trying to find a purpose. A purpose, mm -hmm. but an instant gratification. Mm -hmm. and they want to they want to feel I guess every single week something new, something accomplished. That's how we are when we Well, play that's football. when we play football. Yeah, right? Every exactly. single week it was some that anticipation mm -hmm. before the game, that excitement. Guys want that back and they gotta figure it out somehow, some way, whether it's you know, you buy a car. You go to the club, you go to the trip, you, you buy expensive stuff. Like those are the traps that guys begin to get into because they don't know who they really are. And, and that's all I want to do is just bring that out. I want guys to discover who they really are and, and not worry about the fans, not worry about their family, worry about really themselves and, and build that identity back up again so they can really thrive going forward. Because a lot of us finish when we're in our thirties. We got this long life that we don't really get to mm -hmm. think about, you know, because we're only thinking about just the NFL. And after that, it's nothing else. We've made it to that ultimate goal that we wanted since we were a kid. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, I accomplished that. What do I do next? And, and that's the mindset I want guys to, to think about when they're done with the game. Wow. And you have really found your identity, like, in this business world. Mm -hmm. You know, you've really been behind that, creating ideas, creating projects. We just talked before this. Mm -hmm. You know, you're learning a new craft. Can you tell us, like, about your business ventures and really what you're you're doing and what you're working on for the future. <laughs> some of them I can, some of them I've signed NDA, so I really okay, can't. Okay, okay, okay. No, what uh, you can tell us? Yeah, I can. I have a, a liquor company that I got into a partnership with, with three guys three, about three years ago. When I got released from Dallas, I came home, actually that same day I came mm -hmm. home, and I just wanted to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I wanted to play football, but if it happened, it happened. If it didn't, I need to find something else, at least that I'm interested in, uh, so I can see if I really like it. In that case, in the case of football not working, I can see if I can go into it and then see if I can develop and I can be a part of whatever it is I decide to do. Right. So I got on the internet, I started searching. The first thing I did was real estate. I was like, no, this is boring. <laughs> Next was stock market, so this is boring. And then I went to a crowdfunding page and I just started searching for stuff that I could invest in as far as a, a business. And I came across this uh, alcohol company. My office. This is cool. Let me see what it is. I started reading about it, reading the guys in there, people who's associated the history behind uh, the liquor and it was yellow rum. And they, they ended up explaining the history of who created it and you know, the different flavors and what their intentions are, what they want to do, not there for the world. And, and the investors that were coming in were all the business owners too. So I'm thinking to myself, this is a comfortable space. This is cool. It was a crowdfunding page. I only put 200 bucks in at first and I just left it be. And I had a golf tournament coming up a couple months later and I asked this guy if they could be a part of it. And I didn't know at the time, they had just got accepted into a Google accelerator program. And 
for people that don't know, that's basically Google telling you how the world works mm -hmm. in a sense. And the last company to be a part of, last liquor company was Tito's Bar. Oh, wow. And we're the second, we're the second liquor company that has been involved. That's great company. So you can kind of mm -hmm. see where I'm going. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so we're in a good place right now. And, and, but I didn't know that going in, I didn't know they just started. So they didn't get back to me at least another year. So it was 17 and then and the 18 that got back to me and they, they wrote a long email apologizing and they wanted to make it up to me so they sent some bottles i tried it and i was like man this is this is really good and i started talking to the owner phil and he started explaining to me that there's more history than i thought that was behind the brand and i said this is something that needs to be pushed more and you know, these guys are doing this from denver colorado but they're reaching florida you know they're in tampa they're in south florida they're selling internationally they're selling online so you guys are really smart and I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of a team. You know, I felt like I had a purpose to mm -hmm. jump on board with them. So, you know, as the years were going by, the more we were able to establish a relationship, more of a trust factor. And then you know, on Sundays, man, they voted me on their advisory board and now I'm on their board of directors. And, and here we are selling rum. And we're doing it online, which is more unique than, than other companies because everybody's just trying to be in a liquor store. And we, We've kind of shifted that even before all this pandemic stuff has happened we felt like we have a stronger presence online because we don't have to go through all the politics right trying it was to sell kind it. of a, a move ahead of the trend no, it, far ahead. yeah far ahead yeah, of the trend far. because now look everything is ordered online oh yeah definitely so wow that's pretty incredible yeah. do you have anything else oh uh, yeah i got a bunch that was in a nutshell that was it but i have an app it's called coingo and i opened up my store a 3d printing store two years ago down in Miami Beach and I found the problem was trying to market a new product that nobody really knew about and I started struggling with that because I didn't know how to attack that. I didn't know who to captivate. I didn't know how to really get people in my store. It's good to have a store. People would see it. They would come in, but I wanted more people to come in. Mm -hmm. So I had to dive in and find different programs, different companies that I could use to really extend my reach. But what I found out was a lot of these companies aren't doing a lot of work. They're just giving you numbers. They're emailing you numbers. They're just saying, well, we had 7,000 people come on and see your site. That's cool, but how many people came to my store for most people that visit my site? That was a discrepancy that I was seeing from people trying to sell something to us as far as an SEO company mm -hmm. that gets marketed. And what's the conversion rate? Right? It was no, really no conversion. Mm -hmm. out, honestly, I was spending on 500 bucks a week on somebody that wasn't performing. So for me, I started thinking there has to be another way to enhance small businesses and how they market and how they can not worry so much about how they're going to market, but they can run their business and know that there's somebody driving traffic to them. You know, we don't, we're not trying to sell them anything. We just want to make sure that we're helping the business captivate the people that need, and then you sell it out. Right. So then I started developing this, this app and then all of a sudden I, I came to a standstill. And I was just stuck. I didn't know what to do after as far as enhancing the business experience for small businesses. So my brother comes along. My brother comes in and I ask him, well, what are the things that we can do to help them? And he came out with a formula. He came out with his own, I guess, enhancement AI stuff to be able to captivate people and let them know what your demographic is, where they live, and be able to captivate them to come onto your store. But after they do that, we'll enhance it to where we force them to see what you're about. And then after that, it's what you create and what you want to sell is up to you. So we're going to get them there for you, who you want as far as your demographic. Right, the rest is up to you. And everything else is up to you. Our, our model is kind of following Rackerton and Ibotta. And when they, they first initially started about a decade ago, they were doing the same thing. They're still doing it, but not as much because they've grown so much. But we're following that same trend, but we want to enhance it more for the small business aspect. And we feel like, especially with everything going on now, it's it's made us more excited about the possibilities because we know more people are going to be selling online. They're going to be advertising. Absolutely. Online. So we've, uh, we've uh, done some good things with that. The, the app is called CoinGo. For people don't know, I, I decided to to make this because Go is basically an acronym for greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. And then you're saving coins. So I just put those two things together and here we are. It's kind of funny, but it's at the same time, it's catchy. It is catchy. I like catchy things. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, okay, so let's talk about what do you think before we get into the q a okay well that wasn't q a oh, okay. no 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 we have q a much more q a but i want to know 
what does taking your first two steps really mean to you? Because you did it, I, I mean, I think you did it when you became part of the NFL. And then now I think you're even more so doing it, doing all these business ventures. Like, what does it mean to you? Me, it, it, it's really about trusting, trusting your steps. Anytime you take a step, you got to trust where you're going. Like if you, anybody that tears their ACL, they don't, they forget how to walk. Like you have to restart yourself mm -hmm. when you're walking again. You have to learn how to take that first step. And you have to learn what it feels like. You have to learn how it feels. You got to learn where you're going, where you're stepping, so you can take that next step. And if you can't do that with your first step, you're going to trip and fall. You're going you're to stumble. So I think you got to be aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it on your process and on your path, because I think that only makes you stronger. And every single step that you take to try and get to where you're going, you're just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. You're going to get more wise, you're going to get more aware. And then after that, you're going to be able to go where you want to go. So I think your first steps are important. I think your first steps are vital. I think your first steps are your foundation to your process and completing whatever goal you might have. So for me, it's that's what it means. Wow. Thank you so much. No we got to get into some Q&A with Floyd and Brian. You guys, we're live right now. This is exciting. How amazing is Nolan Carroll, huh? I'm cool. <laughs> there you go. Look at that. He invited us into his home, no problems on a Saturday morning. <laughs> so kind. Ready? Yep. Yeah. Nolan, I got to ask. Uh, talked about it briefly earlier. It seems like high school, college, both bad injuries. You came back, incredible business. When you reach a certain level, you may touch your diet. How did um, you continue to bounce back? What drove you? It seemed like you'd be on a roll. You'd get in there, pick up a hard game, a tough game, and then an injury would hit you. It seems like but you continue to come back each time. What made you? Okay, I got to give a sound to you guys for the questions. Can you just one second? You're good. Hi. Hello. Okay. Are we still rolling? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm just trying to get their sound through for them. Well, I know that Brian definitely, until we get that all situated, I know he wanted to ask you. I mean, he kind of asked you when he walked in, but the injuries. Mm -hmm. you, you had... Injuries when you were in high school, injuries when you were in college, and then the NFL. But you kept coming back. Why? What? What really drove you? Why? Like not, not just like why, but <laughs> okay, why? Ready for Brian. we're ready for Brian's question. Okay, there you go. Okay. Brian? Yeah. No, go ahead, Rock. You were on it right there. Okay. It was, okay. Rock knew it all, but basically, I mean, high school, and then you still were one of the top ranked players, which. Being a Florida guy, you had such a Florida, all the southern schools, you decided to go up north to Maryland, which is freezing. And then, you know, you loved it. You had an injury up there. One of the pros had injuries. But everywhere you went, you came back from an injury, was a winner, with starting lineups. Um, how? Why? What drove you to continue to... Was it just a, a personal thing like about it, but it seemed like there was an ankle or a leg or something that happened or a concussion and you were just like, the hell with it. I'll be, I'll be out there next week. What mentality, how, what drove you to want to, you know, every week come back more and more stronger? Yeah, that's easy. It was just people telling me I can't do it. Like that was the bottom line. Everybody kept saying we well, can or, you know, you sure about this? That, that pissed me off more than anything mm -hmm. because you don't really know me. You're, you're limiting me if you're telling me, oh, this is going to be tough, this is going to be hard. I remember, I think it was, not when I broke my leg in high school. When I broke my leg in high school, I was shocked. But that was like the foundation. And I had no idea what was going to happen. In the future, yeah. I had no idea, mm -hmm. but I knew that that one was a shock to me because I had never experienced something like that. But then through just the months and really going through rehab, I was able to know, all right, I can get through this. I've gone through it before. If it happens again, I'll be able to get through it again. And if it happened in college, my senior year in college, I was supposed to, I was supposed to at least, I had a late first round grade, early second round. A lot of people don't know that, of course it wouldn't, but 
I broke my leg my second year, my second game in my senior season. So I lost the whole mm-hmm. season. I lost, I mean, everybody did it. Everybody forgot about me, which was fine. But I got opposition again. I had my head coach, I had athletic director, I had, I had my own position coach, I had my own teammates telling me, I mean, your season, your football career might be over. You might not get drafted. You might, you might have to come back another wow. year. And, and I would hear these negative things and I would be, I'd get pissed off. I'm like, do you guys know who you're talking to? Like, I'm, I've done it before. I can do it again. So don't, don't come to me with that. If anything, keep it in your minds, keep it in your room, but don't bring it to me because if you do, I'm just going to prove you wrong. Like I continually do. And, and that's what I did. I didn't get drafted. And then after that, I broke my leg again when I was in Philly and it was the same thing. You know, it was, oh, it was his contract year. He's not going to have a big contract. He's going to have to sign a, basically a prove it deal. And mind you, I was playing like, if, if you compare my stats that year to any other guy and they played 16 games, I only played 12. My stats were just as well as them. And they, these guys were going to the Pro Bowls and crazy stuff. And I wouldn't even get considered, but yeah, you put my stats next to theirs and yeah. you couldn't see a difference. If anything else, I played better than most of these guys. But, you know, it's the stuff that is politics in the NFL. But at the end of the day, I had to deal with the naysayers. I had to deal with the reporters thinking, well, he's not going to be as fast anymore. He's not going to, he's going to have to compete for a spot. He might get cut next year. Like, I had to deal with just so much. And, it just drove me to always prove people wrong. And here I am today, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of just living my life. Mm-hmm. Look what I just did. If you guys want to go and see the I got, I got yeah. a resume for mm-hmm. just me proving me wrong. So for me, that's always been my, my drive to my answers as far as dealing with adversity and things that went through for my injuries. And like that's that. basically how I'm built. I've always been built like that. Regardless of my injuries, I've always felt that I need to prove to myself that I can do it before I prove to anybody else. And, and that's how I, Wow! Uh, to take adversity and and to put it in such a like positive aspect oh, that that's oh. incredible. But it takes people cannot do that. Yeah, yeah. Sure. It's, it's, people balanced. cannot. A lot of people cannot do that. Um, okay, so we have Floyd. I know Floyd definitely wants to ask you a question. <laughs> What's up, Nolan? What's up, Floyd? Man, you know everything is good. Appreciate you being on the show this week. Of course, bro. Uh, we all know about your football. Let's get into your love for the cars. I know you're a car guy. You come yeah. hang out with us on the weekends. Tell me about your cars, how you got into the car, how you become a, a passionate car guy. Let's go with that. All right. Yeah, man. This started when I was, I think maybe the third grade, I believe, probably fourth grade. My dad gave me a car model, the 1997 Mustang, and he's, he said, just put it together. And you know, I knew nothing about putting a model together, none of that stuff. But he gave me the glue, he gave me the scissors, and he gave me the car model. And I just had to figure it out myself. And I built it, and I was like, whoa, this is nice. It's a nice car. <laughs> so I started getting to old school cars a little bit more. And my favorite was uh, the Cutlass, the 1972 Cutlass. I started looking at Chevelles, and I started looking at GTOs. Like, I got really into that. And then it wasn't until I got down to Miami. Now, my, I didn't know what a Lamborghini looked like. I didn't know what a Ferrari looked like. I had no idea. Like, exotic cars. And then I seen one in Miami. I was like, wow, this is, this is dope. This is cool. I like this stuff. And I met Floyd. And oh, when I met man. him, he pulls up in his Jag. And I guess the Jag is just remodeled or whatever it was. There's a new body style. He put me in the car and he was driving me around. We're just talking. This is the first day I ever met him. And I'm in a nice car. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, and he he kind of issued, like, made the gateway open as far as other cars being out there. Because my mind was just stuck on when I get in the NFL, I want to challenge her in old school, and I'm set for life. That's yeah, it. I'm good. But then as I started diving in more, I was like, man, I, I like these cars. I like these machines. I like what they can do. I just started doing my research into it, and I started appreciating the cars more about not being flashy and going out to the clubs and stuff, but really driving cars. People that know me, I put miles on my cars. I have a Phantom, I have a McLaren, I have a Cullinan. I got, they're not out here right now, but my lineage of cars I've had, I've had some and some monsters and, uh-huh. and I just, I just appreciate, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy that likes to get on the road when I, I'm stuck thinking or I need some ideas. I'll just go out and just cruise. You know, I'll go by the beach and pull a lot of daylight, the windows down and just chill. But that helps me relax. That helps me mm-hmm. just be at peace because I like that stuff. I know that all my hard work, everything that I've done, I've been able to, to put it into cars. I've been able to afford it to drive it. That's been my, it's become my new passion. And, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for 
my path and my my route that I'm taking in life because there's been it could be so many other things that I could do and have interest in and I probably will down the end of the road but right now it's, it's really cause it's just wow. I just appreciate it all the time I definitely appreciate Floyd for always letting me come to those uh, those rallies and supercar Saturdays it's always fun because I, I just enjoy just the cars itself I enjoy the people that come out and you know, get to talk to many different people and they have many different jobs many different Passive, they're taking their life, but you know, here they are with uh, McLaren Cena. They got a lot far, they got a Bugatti, but those guys are you know, they're cool guys. They're guys that you can talk to and bounce ideas off of. A lot of people that I've met have been in the business world and they have cars. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like a business gathering. So, what Floyd has really done is enhanced the business side, the exotic side, and put them together and made it made it a club and made it fun for, for people to come out there and enjoy it and really enjoy the cars and really understanding what cars are out there. So, every time I'm there. I'm always learning something new. I'm always seeing something new and meeting somebody new. So I'm definitely appreciative of getting into that avenue and that route of, of cars. I, I I can't tell a lie. I need to be. I need to go. I've never gone. You have to. Yeah, yeah so, I know. So no, you're no, up. You I, have to. I definitely know my brother's going to be jealous of this. So, um, so do we have another question from Brian? One more. No. Oh, yeah. Lloyd, another question. You say that. Taking up your Saturday to come out and join us on first two steps. Roxy, you're a rock star as always. You know, Brian, appreciate you guys. Oh, I appreciate you, man, as always. Thank you so much, everyone that's tuned in to first two steps. This is only the second episode. We have so much more for you. Thank you to Brian, Florida, and of course, you're amazing, Nolan Carroll. Thank you so much. No